Welcome back to Worth the Ever Woodwork. About two years ago, a company called Inventables approached a lot of us DIY YouTubers with a proposal. They wanted to send us a, a X car, their DIY put it together CNC kit for free in exchange for an honest opinion of the product, its build process, and what you could do with it, and plus they asked us to build something with it. Seemed like a fairly fair trade, but initially I turned them down. But they followed up with me and I did a little investigation of the company I, I eventually accepted for one simple reason. I really respected their the community they were building around not only their product, but this whole DIY CNC environment. The head names of the company were on the forum seemingly on an hourly basis answering people's questions and developing a very positive atmosphere. And that's just not something you see a lot out there in small or even big companies. And it's something I wanted to encourage. And that's the main reason why I accepted their offer. And you can see my video. It's still on my channel. I think I was fairly fair. I gave a good positive and negative reviews. I explained why I had the opinion I had. And I told you the main bottlenecks that I was having with it. Since then, Inventables has been constantly improving their product. And the community has been building. And because of that, about two weeks ago, they approached me again because they made enough changes on the product that's pretty much a whole new item. And they wanted me to do a compare and contrast with the old version. So they sent me another X card with all the new componentry. I'm going to assemble it and give you an honest opinion on the process. And we're going to build not only some of the old products I did so I can have a fair compare and contrast, but we'll see how far they've come along. So, today, Let's build a CNC machine. So before we begin, let's talk about some of the things that they say they've improved. Now in the first versions, uh, in the assembly process, a lot of people complained about having to tap the threads. And what I say to them was, y'all were wimps. They gave you self-tapping screws. You really just had to screw them in fairly slowly with a little bit of torque, but it wasn't that big a deal. Other people had problems with the belts were slipping. That's a little bit more of an issue. It wasn't too hard. Just simple zip time solved it. But Inventables took the time to come up with some new parts that will eliminate the problem up together. Now from there, in the initial kit, you basically had two different versions of those stepper motors, the parts that move the CNC machine around on the thing. And you had two different versions of the spindle. What they have done, because enough people were just upgrading and using little trim routers instead of spindles because they had so much more power and they could do different size uh, bits uh, that Inventables went ahead and scrapped using the spindles that they had and are just using this uh, DeWalt CNC, I mean DeWalt spindle router right now. But if you've ever hot rodded a car or added, thrown in a huge monster engine into a small car, you know increasing the power and increasing the weight source of the power causes problems. Now a lot of those people that were doing the DIY upgrade in the beginning ones, they were finding that hanging that weight out above the gantry a little ways was causing it to rotate a little bit. So they were at a little tension there. So they were doing processes to improve the rigidity of the gantry, especially on the big huge long ones. So what did Inventables do? They're just doing that straight from the factory right now since they're giving the upgraded uh, spindle with a rod, using a router now. They're just doing it right off the get-go. Also, they've upgraded to the better quality stepper motors because you are moving more weight, so it will be a lot more reliable on the get-go. What I found kind of cool is all those initial Im uh, improvements, they haven't seemed to increase the price that much. I'm assuming that over time, they develop efficiencies in the packaging, the manufacturing, and stuff like that to offset the cost. But I think that's kind of cool. Uh, I will say, the packaging that came with seems a lot less complicated now. They have fewer boxes. This whole entire kit came in five boxes via UPS. I did have an issue there. I got... I ordered the 750 kit now. And the first time I, I got the 1000 kit, for the simple reason the 500 kit was just a few inches smaller for the products that I wanted to do. I wanted to be able to letter carve on 12 inch platters and you just couldn't do that one with a 500. 
So I ended up having to get the big huge one and in my original video I said I intended to cut it down. Well they've since come out with a 750 version which is about the size I wanted so that's the one I chose in this particular build. And they sent me the 750 rails. But they also sent me the 1000 rails. And we, I didn't realize that they had sent me two rails. All I knew was that they didn't send the backer board uh, to the project. And one phone call was all it took, no questions asked. They had a backer board coming to me and they asked me to look at my parts and see what was going on because they wanted to figure out why something went wrong. Remember me going back to that customer service? It wasn't them solving the problem. It was figuring out why it happened. And what it turned out was the 1,000 rails weighed 15 pounds. The 750 CC backer board weighed 15 pounds. The UPS guy that picked up the uh, products at their shipping factory got the, order, uh, the part numbers wrong because he was just looking at the weight. So they solved that problem and they showed me how it would not happen again. That's quality customer service. They solved the problem, they had the new backer to board to me within a few days, and they followed up, found out why the problem happened, and told me how they were fixing it for future customers. I just like that customer, kind of customer service. Now the first thing I like to do is make sure I have do my complete inventory and lay out all the parts so that I can see them very easily. They give you a nice inventory list on their instructions. So I'm going to open up all the boxes and spread the par all parts out. And I'm going to assemble the project on this table right here. So if at all possible, I suggest you set up some kind of folding table or something like that so that you can have the parts and the assembly area and it will make life a lot easier for you. So let's go through these parts. Now I set the accessories and stuff that, that I'm not going to use right away to the side because they're irrelevant for the point. And I did grab my magnetic tool tray and some Dixie cups. The Dixie cups will keep the different size screws separated and placing everything in that magnetic tray means that if you bump it, you're not going to lose stuff all over the floor. That has been a lifesaver for me in the past. Now, I will say this, the toolkit they provided this time, much, much better. Better quality and more variety. Uh, I am kind of excited about that Z probe accessory. And these new wire runners, they're a different style. I'll have to pass, wait to pass judgment on those. I will say this though the rails for the gantry and the sides, they seem a lot beefier to me. Not only in weight, but I'm just looking at the structure. I think that's where they solved a lot of their flexing problems. So I think that's going to work out pretty good. And the electronics, so much nicer than those Arduinos. And everything seems to have the connectors on it, which. I think it's going to be a really nice addition. And I really like the fact that they gave us Acme threads right from the get-go. That used to be an upgrade accessory. And Inventables, thank you, thank you, thank you for giving us a bag of zip ties. Now the instructions are completely online. And that's a theme you're going to hear a lot with Inventables. They put everything online so that they have control of it. They can update it when they need to. The pictures are fairly clear. The instructions are, I mean, they're written very, very well. Uh, and it goes pretty easily. I mean, anybody with any sense will be able to figure out these instructions. It is not hard. But the first thing they ask us to do is to put in all these screws into the backer board. I will say Inventables, give us a 50 cent tool. Give us a little hex head key for these things. It would make life a lot easier. I cannot imagine doing all this with a church key. It would have taken forever and my wrist would have been dead. Now over the next three minutes, I tried to film every single step or at least the key points in there. And if I found out something I could do a little bit easier than they decided in the instructions, I did film my solution. For example, an A, B, and C right now. I found it much easier to slide the rails on after you put the little slider screws in than trying to find that screw to begin with. And there were some instances where I ran into a few hiccups and I'll try and point them out. But I want to make this very clear. This is something that anybody can do. There's nothing overly complicated about this. Even if you've never assembled anything, just look at the pictures and follow the instructions. Now there were times like an example D right now, where at some point you had to get the hex key they provided into a small slot. Well, it just doesn't fit. So what's the solution? Just grind it down a little bit until it did fit. So when you ran into these hiccups like that, the solution is 
pretty obvious and you will be able to figure it out. Don't sweat it. Now the whole thing seems to be broken up into sections. You had the main frame and the waste board that went together. Then you assembled the Z-index, the part that held the spindle. Then you assembled the rails and the pulleys and then the side rails. Each section was fairly simple. And in the wiring, that was incredibly easy. They give you really nice fasteners. I will say this, a lot of people in example C in the video had a hard time opening these sections. My easiest solution was to just turn it on the side, grab a screwdriver, and twist it open, and they will stay open that way. Uh, this was a new style of cord holder to me, but I do think it is a lot more rigid. And in the future, if I want to wire in any additional accessories, this will be a lot easier than having to thread it through an already overstuffed hole. So that I think that was a very smart upgrade for Inventables to do. Now look up in section B real quickly. This is installing these wire holders that you zip tie the wires to for organization. I did not have the physical hand strength because of carpal tunnel to twist those on. So the simple solution for me was to just get two blocks of wood, put them on side, either side and squeeze them together. That increased my leverage. Also look in section D right now. The screws I'm taking off right there, well in the instructions they list those as if they were in a bag somewhere and it took me a good half hour to realize that they were already installed on the power controller and you had to take them off to slide in these uh, cable couplers so I don't know if that's the right term or not but uh, so understand that that was the only time I couldn't find parts and that was only because they were already installed and I had to take them off otherwise the entire setup of this uh, power controller unit really really nice really simple really elegant I was impressed with that I do want to reiterate there was nothing about this project that was overly complex that an utter beginner couldn't do just take your time you'll figure it out okay I'm to the point now where I I finished the build I plugged it in I made sure power is going everywhere so I've done everything to the point of plugging in my computer I want to take a break now and talk about my impression to this point. And I'll kind of differentiate this video from my first one because I'm breaking up into the build, then the setup and tuning of it, and the actual use. Now, some of the things I've really liked and impressed so far. Mostly, oh my, this controller unit, it looks so much more professional. It actually looks like somebody really did a lot of thinking through. The first version, it worked very well, but you did have to do wires from here to there because you were assembling the Arduinos in a certain way and they were trying to make it simple for construction. But it did look kind of hacked together. This one looks a lot more elegant and you're not going to have to be answering questions or why are wires going at? It just looks better and I know that's kind of a superficial thing, but I really do like that aspect of it. Another thing. Assembling this dust collector, I can see how effective it's going to be and how useful it is. And the fact that you can just get it out of the way quickly when you don't need it is very nice. I know they kind of borrowed some of the ideas that did, uh, from people that were doing prototyping and proved upon it, but the magnets, the way it's adjusted here, it's quick, it's easy, and I can see how well it's going to work. I'm kind of impressed about that. Okay, real quickly I want to talk about the wiring. And oh my, did they make it a lot easier. Adding these plugs that go into the spindles not only made it quicker assemble, eliminated a lot of potential error, but I'm quite confident it's going to make it a lot more durable in the long term because these wires are now locked together as they go into that vibrating spindle, whereas in the old days they were kind of loose. So each wire had to support just itself. Now they're, it's stronger together. And they added connectors on this end, so all you had to do is insert them and pull them together. I really like the fact that they labeled both ends, made organizing the connection here a lot easier. Now, having said that, I don't like the connectors on that end. Basically, they don't add too much to the overall durability, strength, or ease of assembly than just snipping the wires and stripping off a little bit on the end. And, but, because they had to put uh, the wire a specific length, they did all that at the factory. 
Now I had a problem in that in my first go round, I left a little bit of slack on this side. But that meant is I didn't have enough wire on this end to plug it in there. So I had to come back through, loosen everything, restretch them out to take away all the slack on this end so that I would have just the perfect amount of cable to insert right here. Which means this unit is designed that the X controller can only go right there. And I think that's a bit of a missed opportunity in their target market. Because I don't think very many people are going, a lot of people are going to be leaving it with this really cool side extension, which is just perfect for this kind of setup. Because in the old setup, the, the controller was just all over the place. And there's a lot of potential for damage as it just, dang, if it got knocked off and dangled. I mean, this is just a lot better. But there's going to be a lot of people like me that are going to build a custom di setup or display for it. I'm going to make a table that's going to be a lot more reduced than what it's sitting on right now. Eliminating this whole side section because I really don't need it. But in order to do that section, I need to be able to tuck this up underneath out of the way. And then in order to do that one, I either have to rewire the whole thing or have to add extensions to each one of those. My opinion is it would have been nicer just to have the really cool connections for the, spin, uh, for the stepper motors and leave the wires long so we can set up our specific length. Next up, I actually want to talk about the actual hardware. While the wiring made things simpler and less frustrating, even though I, I know I'm going to have to do more in the future, that was offset with some frustration I had with the actual parts and putting it together. And I'm quite confident that if I'd simply called Inventables, they would have either overnighted me or sent me the parts. But my frustration was parts that should have been equal length weren't and I sat there and debated do I send it back to them or do I just recut it myself I'm in a position where I could recut it myself so that's why I did but I imagine there are a lot of people that are just getting into this and this is an entry-level DIY CNC machine that might not have my capabilities so I thought I, I needed to tell you all that and the machining problem I had is when I was assembling it I came to a point where I was assembling this back corner right here and I noticed there was a gap and I couldn't figure out why. I then measured my two side rails and I found out that one was actually longer than the other. I also noted the cut on the end of one of them, the, the longer one, it wasn't a perfectly flat surface. So I just, just decided to recut it myself. I cut them both to equal length and I reinstalled it and they took care of most of the gap. I then had to sit and think, well, why didn't it take care of all of it? Well, I started thinking that maybe the, since the undercarriage was attached to this MDF backer board, it was out of square. That wasn't the case. This is a perfect square. 90 degrees, everything's great with that. But when I measured underneath from the two bottom and top rails, that distance wasn't equal. And I can't explain why without taking the whole thing apart. So I started thinking, does it really matter if this side is shorter than that side? And I came to the conclusion, no, it doesn't. As long as this, this, these, they're parallel, the gantry is going to track perfectly. What it is going to affect is tuning it. Because you don't want, you want your 90 degree cuts to be perfect. You don't want it to be kind of 90 degrees and this one going that way. So occasionally, because you're using belts and they stretch, you have to readjust everything. So what you do is, you, uh, in the old version, I would push it all the way forward and I would make measurements from the, from the front section and make sure that they were even. Now what this is going to mean is I'm going to have to lay down a sacrificial board. I'm going to have to make a cut this way along the X or Y axis. I don't, uh, the Y axis. And then I'm going to have to make a cut along the X axis and measure that to make sure it's going in a perfect 90 degrees. If it isn't, I have to make an adjustment and then recut another line to make sure it's 90 degrees. And I have to keep doing that as trial and error. There is no real measurement. It, it is trial and error. And it also means that this back board is not going to be as accurate. So if I'm laying something down that I need it to make a perfect parallel cut, I need to have that test cut and then a reference line that is going off of that is going to be the 90 degrees. Long story short, 
it means a little bit more work in tuning up for me that I don't think a lot of people would want to do. I also think I need to talk about the wheels and how they attach them. Very good design improvement. They are now using offset spacers instead of offset nuts. Made adjustments so much easier. But the spacers required kind of a Morrison tenon joint where it had a larger shoulder so that it wouldn't come through. It gave something a brace to. And I found that this hole down here was not big enough for that tenon to slide into. And I did interchange them I mean, I, to make sure it was the hole and not that one bad part. Uh, the solution for me was to just grab a drill bit and drill it out. You know, it takes 15, 20 seconds. But not everyone's going to have the capabilities I have here. Now, I am fully confident a quick phone call to Inventables, and they probably would have sent me one or two of these to, just to be sure. But it's one of those things that, A, I have a problem here, and then there's two-day wait to get back into it. Then there's this problem here, both of the machining problems, and that would have been another few days I had the capabilities to fix it. I just fixed it and didn't really tell them about it. But I'm not. I don't think that's something that we should have to do. Uh, this was a manufacturing slip up. Now these very minor machine variances, I believe, are just kind of growing pains because Inventables is at that point where they are starting to really rapidly grow. You have certain staff that are doing too much work, and they're hiring in new staff to back it up, and it's just kind of growing pains and minor quality controls happen to that in that stage of the company but it's also good things that they have enough business to grow I like that it's going to help the bigger community overall in the long run and I say that one because of my impressions of the instructions now in the first version I kind of commented that they had great instructions it was easy to follow but in hindsight it was the fact that they had written text on their website and a video so, I would read through the entire section, then watch the entire video, then go back to each little paragraph that described one section of it, and rewind the video as I went through it. That way, if there was something wrong with the text, I would see the correction in the video, or if there was something in the video I didn't understand, the chances are the text explained it properly. It was that ability to, to discern two different inputs, learning styles, that made it very, very clear. We don't have the videos now. It was straight text. And I could actually tell via the writing style that they had a lot of different people putting their hands on it. And you could also tell that sometimes they would just take the copy paste, the old instructions, paste them in here. The reason why I say that one, there's a, very, a lot of instances where the parts that were described in the inventory at the top of the section, the part that it was described in the paragraph of the section, and the labels that were on the parts bag were all different. Now, the numbers on the, those part numbers were always the same. But, you know, they call different things different terms. And they would label that one there. And I imagine as they bought new inventory, the, the companies they were buying from had different labels for those parts. So they would just kind of add the new labels. And over time, those kind of errors creeped in. And that was just kind of frustrating for me because... I think like most people, I don't look at the parts numbers, I look at the description. Hey, go find Wiz Gizmo. Oh, it's called What Gizmo over here. Well, Wiz Gizmo, okay, I don't have Wiz Gizmo. What's going on? And then over time, I figured out, just look at the numbers, but it was just a bit frustrating for me. Now, my suggestion for basically any company that's doing this kind of stuff and has to create instructions, put a casting call out. You want a middle school science nerd. Put a casting call out there. Bring them in and let them build your project. They will read your instructions and totally scrap the old ones, rewrite all new ones based upon the input you get from this kit. Because there's going to be times where you say something like, uh, don't strip the screws as you put it into the aluminum. Well, the kid's going to say, well, what's that mean? Well, you can explain. Hey, the screw is steel. It's a lot harder than aluminum, and it's very easy to cross-thread them so that as it goes together, it gets really hard and goes in that angle and it doesn't hold as well, and you can't really repair it without drilling and yeah, 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 yeah. So, in order to avoid all that headache, whenever you put the screw in, just go backwards a little while until you feel the threads click, and that way when you go forward, it will engage perfectly. 
that's something like somebody like me or people that built, built this kind of stuff before, they kind of know that intuitively. But an enthusiastic newbie might not know that one. So they'll just kind of come in and put, oh, it's not, let's push harder and strip it out. Unknowing, just try, just doing their best. Somebody like that is also going to put out, hey, I can't find this part. And you can say, well, look at the part. And I'm, oh, wait, okay, we need to check the labels. It's little things like that uh, that work really, really well. And I personally think Indenables needs to just scrap it all, bring in a kid, Film them as the assembly it so you can have the video and text. And more importantly, the text will be written by one person and it will be very, very thorough. Now, I think I probably focused a little bit too much on my frustrations in the build. Uh, it was a little bit more frustrating than the original one, but it is completely doable by just about anybody. Uh, it just required a little bit of thought. And the little nut up here, uh, you can pick up these little ratcheting heads at most hardware stores. I got these in the $2 bin up by the counter. Pick yourself up a, a 10 millimeter wrench and it makes a, moving this Z-axis a whole bunch easier and you don't have to build a little handle for that one. Great little investment. Now setup is mainly a software issue, but before you turn on the machine, you've got to put in a bit. And the collet that came with the trim router is a quarter inch collet, so Inventables gives you a really high quality eighth inch collet, which is the most common size for CNC end mills. And the end mills that I've got in the pack are a little bit different than the ones I got the first go round, in that they had this nice little plastic I guess shoulder or something like that for you to bump up into the collet and they're color coordinated so it's very easy to tell which bit you have. Now I'm using a straight fluted bit two blades on it I, I'm not sure if that's the right term for it but it's got two blades and straight flutes. Uh, I will say this Mo up at Inventables did a live session that they archived on the Inventables YouTube that did a very good explanation of what all the different bits do and the kind of quality you're going to get from them. The next step is just to secure your medium. I'm just using a pine board that I'm plying down to about a half inch and this time I'm trying their attachment devices. But chances are I'm just going to end up back to my old setup where I just put two-sided tape on the back of all my projects. To home it, I just make sure that the power is off so that the spin, stepper motors will spin freely and then just move the gantry and the Z index by hand. It's a lot easier than doing it within the software. From there it's just a matter of walking through the wizards at the Inventables easel website. I will tell you, you're going to walk through them quite a bit because for some reason the back function just sends you all the way back to the beginning and when it does go back to the beginning sometimes it won't find the machine. I can't explain it. Uh, so you just have to shut the whole uh, website down and then go back in. But after a few setups, you kind of get these first first few pages down really quickly. So it's not that big of a hassle, just a minor frustration. Uh, basically, all they're asking you to do is identify your trim router, the size of your machine, uh, what kind of thread you're using. They only do Acme now, which is a big plus. Uh, and then what bit you're using. Well, I think it's a, the axe at that point in time. And then it's just a matter of connecting to your X-Carve and setting thing up. Next, they make sure that you've got it wired together. So they use these little arrows. Now, I will say this. The first time I went through the wizard, the arrows made it go backwards. But this must be a common enough problem that they have a little button that reverses the polarity on it to do it. Now, this one another time I went through, the, t the X axis worked perfectly, but the Y axis was different. So for some reason, the first go round it saved the X and the Z axis reversing the wires, but not the Y. And I can't explain that one. So it might be something you need to check every now and then. Another thing is when you set up the uh, stops, uh, the stops for the X and Y axis, uh, for some reason, my Y axis went backwards the wrong way. And they had a little button that you could push, just kind of like you're reading right here. Uh, that says, hey, you want us to reverse it for you within the software. You say that one, and it doesn't reverse the Y. It just does all the X's and stuff like that. So just like the first time going around, I'm not going to be setting up the stops, and I probably just won't use them because they don't seem to be doing too much for me. I never did use them the first time around. 
Now, setting up the Z probe was kind of cool, and it was a fun little experiment that showed you how the electricity passes through it. You use the collet at, on the first setup, and then when you set it up on, with a bit, it goes from there. I can tell you this when you do set it up, it took enough time, and I think you'll see that in a second, that it's probably easier just to do it with a little ratcheting socket that I use to move the Z index up and down by hand. It's, it, it'll be quicker. Now the software is very very simple and here's an example. This is the, the trial version they get. It's just a simple little clip art. You select stuff, you can resize it, and you can change it from black, gray to black to white. And what that does is it changes the depth as it goes down. You set up the maximum depth. For example, mine was set up at a half inch board, so totally black would be all the way through. I'm setting up to go just halfway through, so it's just a little get bit gray. And you can see it on the slider on the side. From there, it's just hitting the different buttons and telling it what kind of material you're using and what kind of bit you use. Then you hit carve, and it verifies that, hey, you, have you set this up right? This is how big your board is. Do you have it clamped down properly? Check that before you do anything. Is this the right bit that you're going to be using? Sure, you're just verifying it. And then it asks you, do you want to set up the Z index manually or with the Z probe? And here you can see, it just takes a bit of time to do the Z probe. Technologically, this is a really cool design uh, and accessory, and I'm sure people will speed up with they use it all the time. But it's a lot easier just to power the thing off, and before you start up the program, to manually you move the gantry and the z-axis and then just twist that little knob on top to get it just right at the uh, above your work uh, i just find that quicker uh, but this might be more accurate for super like metals and stuff like that on those initial cuts i don't know i'll play with it a little while but i have a feeling that the z-index is going to go in a drawer this z-index adjusting thing is going to go in the drawer for me in a little while but watch this it touches and then backs it back up. And it didn't even leave any kind of dent in that brass. That's just really cool. And I do get the idiot award. Notice my clamp is all bent up now. Yeah, that dust collector polymer arms are really strong. The spindle moves independent of them. So I just bent it all up because I didn't have it set right. Unfortunately, my dust collector doesn't fit just perfectly. But they had enough suction. And look at how easy these little rare earth magnets just lock everything together and how quickly you can adjust it up and down really cool from there it's just a matter of turning the trim router spindle on putting on your ear protection eye protection and hitting go and we're off to the races now i want you to know something all that sawdust all over the place i didn't have it set up right the bristles were not touching the wood but look how easy this is I hit pause, the whole thing stops. I turn off the uh, trim router, very easy to do. I make the adjustment, drop it down a little bit, tighten it back up, no big deal. And then it was just a matter of hitting the play button to start again, and it started right back up. That was, that's just unimaginable in the old setup. I would have had to stop the whole thing, stop the project, start all over, put new material down. That X controller, the ability to do that one, I use it several times on just this little setup device. Really great option. Now, whoever thought of that, cool upgrade. Let me tell you, I am really impressed with this dust collection setup on it. I mean, what little bit of dust is here is just because I didn't turn the, my vacuum cleaner on right off the get-go. About a minute in, I realized it wasn't turned on. This does so much better than what I had last time. I know it's an accessory, but it should be mandatory. And I even didn't even set it up right properly the first time and had to lower it back down. So, I mean, I'm really impressed with the dust collection. Now, for my first carve, I did a half-inch pine, a half-inch deep. And it, the application actually did tell me, look for those red spots because it won't be able to go through it because the bit was too small. Uh, I didn't really see any red on my monitor, but that could just be I have a very old laptop that I'm going to dedicate to this machine, 
that was out in sunlight over by the door, so I just couldn't see red. I'll have to work on that on my computer end. But I will say that the cut is fairly nice. Could be a new, just a new bit. A little bit of vibration, but I kind of heard that vibration as going on, and I tried changing the speed up a little bit because when I heard the rattle, I hit the pause button and ramped the speed up to see if it would change up. Uh, you can tell a little bit of difference at the different spots between end grain and long grain as it went through, but other than that, it's a pretty good job. So I now know the new model works. So let's see how it works in a small production run, which was how I was using the prior version when I had just the upgraded spindle and not the trim router. I can tell you this, this part right here, the low test, went a lot quicker. I could see it moving move the wood faster. And the project I'm going to do is this little hand mirror. I probably made a little less than 50 of these. I would sell some at the market, but I sold a lot of these to local gift shops and stuff like that. They liked the idea it was locally made and it was made out of wood. And basically it's just a recess that fits a mirror that I buy at Michael's. Goes in like that. And the only thing the machine can do is do the shape. But the shape would allow me the ability to chip carve or I would just do a quick round over on my router table. Do a little sanding and call it done. Very quick projects for me to do, especially if the recess and the shape was already done. Now, on the old version, I would set up boards all the way across. Remember, I had the 1000 one, so it was a little bit bigger. And I would set my diagrams out on the easel. I would just hit start and I would walk away for half a day. It was kind of slow, but my thinking was I was doing something else while this was working, so it kind of did speed up my time. Hopefully, with a new machine, I mean the new trim router, this will go a lot quicker and be a lot more productive for me. Let's find out. Now, if you're using your own material, such as I'm doing right here with a four-quarter piece of pecan that's in rough state, you've got to make sure you've got a flat side to it so it will register against that sacrificial fence. If there's any kind of rocking, even before you put the clamps on it, there's a good chance that it will move while you are CNCing it, and that can be dangerous because that bit can crack right in the middle of it. They are made of carbide, and it might send shrapnel. So you've got to make sure your reference side is dead flat. Here, I'm just running it through a thickness planer because I know later on I'll be cutting into shorter pieces, but even then I'm going to check it for flatness to make sure it doesn't rock before I clamp it up. It's also a good idea to measure all the components that's going to be going into your project before you actually do any programming. Here I'm just measuring the mirror, which is 5 inches, and the board I'm going to be using that I had just planed up, just to make sure everything I program is going to fit. Now I prefer Illustrator for all my drawing, especially vector. I'm just old school that way, and Illustrator is one of my favorite programs. For this particular project, I pulled up my old file and modified it for the new mirror size because it's a tad bit bigger and just did a little repositioning and stuff like that. The key thing is, it doesn't matter what vector art program you use, most of them are going to be able to save in a .svg file format, which you can import into Inventables easel software. So I like to get the initial drawing done there and then just work on the setting of depths and working with the CNC within easel. I just find it's easier. But this particular design that I'm showing you now is so simple, there's really no reason why you couldn't have done it straight through easel. Now I'm going to be working off two machines, which I think is going to be a very common setup for most people that are using a CNC. I've got a nice office machine that's fast and has all my Adobe software that I like. And then I pulled out an old laptop from Mothballs, stripped it off, deleted everything on it, installed a fresh Windows 10, and it's basically just a browser to run the CNC machine uh, with the Inventables drivers. But understand when you're working on two machines like this, the easel software is going to constantly want to talk to the CNC machine and my office machine is not hooked up to it. So it forced me to download the drivers as if it was talking to the CNC machine and installing it wasn't that big a deal. But I ran into a problem in that even after the driver wasn't there, it still wanted to find that mach physical machine for me to do any kind of work. So I had to repeatedly go through and set it up, tell you what kind of machine I had, spindles, all that kind of stuff, like we did before, uh, and then work through the process. And for some reason, it just wouldn't remember my settings, 
if I wasn't on the machine. Did this multiple, multiple times. I'm just showing you a few examples here. I don't know what I did in one of the steps to cause it to remember it, but I haven't had this issue since then. Now I'm walking you through all these steps because I want you to understand how easy Easel is to work once you get it set up. Right now, I'm just, I've imported the SVG file that I created in Illustrator, which can be created in any kind of vector art program. And because I'm making through cuts all the way through, uh, it gives me these little tabs automatically, which is a safety feature because you don't want that interior piece to all of a sudden start running around when you got that spinning bit. That could be very dangerous. But simply by clicking on those yellow tabs, you can reposition them to a location where it's a little bit easier to clean up. Now when you import the SVG file, it just kind of plops it into the middle. You have to relocate it so that it's going to be on that 0, 0, X, Y axis. And from there, it's just a matter of setting up your depths of cut. I've selected the circle right now, and I'm just moving the slider to a half inch because that's about twice as thick as the mirror I'm putting in. I also want you to notice on the left hand side, you have somewhat of a preview, and the board the sizing is on the upper left corner, along with the bit you're going to be using and the density. Hard maple was the closest I had uh, option wise to pecan. And here I'm just positioning it so it'll fit on the board. Now if you do want to use a material other than what you can buy at a CNC supply place, don't be afraid. You don't have to have all the machines that I do to do that one. You can actually buy a whole bunch of different species of wood that's already been dimensioned flat straight from the lumber yard and then just size it up with a $20 handsaw like I'm doing right now. It doesn't have to be perfect cuts because all you're using it as a, is as a material to let the CNC cut the good stuff out. From there, it was just a repeat of our test. Put the material on the wasteboard, lock it down with the clamps, set your Z index, head over to the computer, log in. Any previous files you've created, such as the one I created on my office machine, will be there waiting for you. Just click it and then get ready to hit carve because you did all the work earlier. It'll walk you through that startup wizard. Make sure you've got the right thickness, clamp it down, pick your bit, set your Z index, and once again, it is kind of cool. And I have found that the more I did it, the quicker I got. So I might be using this a lot more often than manually. Who knows, we'll see. It will remind you to remove that uh, Z index probe before you turn on your router, turn on your dust collector, and hit go. Bob's your uncle and you're off to the races. Now many of y'all are going to notice that this thing is moving kind of slow. I'm using all the default settings for what Inventables says should be the proper speed and depth of cut for an eighth inch bit into hard maple, which is a very similar density to pecan, or at least I think it is. It, Inventables chose these rates. The bottleneck now for speed is no longer the spindle, it's the bit itself. An eighth inch bit can only take about a little less than a sixteenth of an inch cut each pass because it can only use half its circumference. But I want you to know something. I'll turn the volume up. You can hear the vibration change as it goes. It's a note going up and down as it goes from hardwood to softwood. Now I'm not too concerned about that speed aspect at this moment. If I needed to, I could actually design parts to make this particular mirror a little quicker. Use the x carve or CNC's to make templates to batch them out with a handheld rock. But as it is, I can set it up and almost ignore it while I'm doing something else. So we put together the new x carve with the new rails, the new gantry, the bigger spindles, the better motors, the X controller, as best we could according to the Inventables instructions. And we've uh, played around with the software uh, and we are redoing one of the projects I did with the original X Carve, this little hand mirror that I sell at Art Markets. So far, we've cut out eight of these blanks and that's about as far as we can go with the X Carve. From here on out, it's going to be hand tools and other power tools. And I'll have a little montage at the end of those little processes. But I want to analyze at this point how the X-Carve is done in the stock configuration. 
Now this is the first one I cut out and I had a very typical problem I was having with the old X-Carve in that power because of a tropical storm that's in the area cut off to my shop and I was running it off a laptop so the laptop didn't power down but the X controller did which made the easel software think that the job was canceled or something so it stopped and asked me how the finished product came turned out. Now I couldn't restart it at that same spot because the X control thought it, I mean easel thought it was done. So I did try to restart it at the beginning because it had just stopped when I had started at just started the program. And then you can see that there I now have this little lip right here because I couldn't get it exactly to the same point. And that return to your original point function in easel didn't work the way you would think. It's just something different. Uh, on the second one I did, I couldn't fit the mirror in here. And if you remember, I specifically measured the mirror five inches. I drew the circle five inches. I even checked it in the easel five inches. But what we have is if you measure across, you measure across one direction from rim to rim, it is a little under five inches. And that doesn't look like much, but when you're trying to fit one part to the other, it is a big deal. Coming the other direction, it is right at five inches. So what could be happening there? Well, if one of the stepper motors isn't calibrated exactly the same to the other, it could cause this to go up. It could also be that the gantry was off a little bit. And if you remember, I haven't tuned this thing up. I've just set it up as instructables has told us to and started using it. Now, is this a big deal if you're doing stuff like signs or making individual parts for single uh, part projects? No big deal whatsoever. But if you're trying to design one thing to fit in another, that will be an issue and you're going to have to go in and adjust the software to calibrate for the individual stepper motors or the tension on the belts or any other variable like that. Also, you notice on the back back of them, I'm gonna go to the second one I did. The second one, I made this five and two thousandths bigger and it started fitting it, the mirrors, but they were a bit loose, but it cut very nicely, nice clean lines. It was going fairly slow, but I want you to notice something on the back. Remember I was saying it, I designed it to go all the way through and it did perfectly. It has not scarred up the cutting board any at all. It went right to that depth, but it only did it in one spot. And if you look at the other ones, on some of them it did it more than one way. There's that little tab I was talking about that you can move around so it wouldn't separate out. And others it didn't do it at all. And the, all these boards are the exact same thickness. What that's telling me is this waste board right here is not level all the way across and that was a problem I had in the original uh, X-Carve 2. You actually have to fidget it or adjust it or put shims to get it so it is flat all the way across in reference to the bottom of your bit. Now if we continue through, notice all of them were cut very very nicely. I'm going to have to do very little trimming it. All I'm going to do is take some sandpaper to the back of it to knock them out and it will sand off all that parts and they will pop out and make nice little mirrors. Also as part of flattening this base you have to understand this is a particle board. Uh, oh, what's it called? I forget. It's basically sawdust compressed. It is going to absorb moisture. They're not supposed to but they do. I noticed this corner over here all the corners have flexed up. The Inventables have three ni really nice screws on the front and back, but they only have one screw on the side. So it's allowing for a little flexing. So we need to go ahead and put a couple screws here to anchor this waste board to the frame rails. And then to adjust this up, we can loosen these corner screws. And because there's a little play there, you can play around with that one to get it just right. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video. I am going to do a montage at the end as I finish up these uh, mirrors, but they're going to use other tools un not associated with the X-Carve, so I was, I'm just going to do that as a montage. Uh, it was a fairly easy build. I had some few fr frustrations, but nothing big, nothing made somebody couldn't take care of themselves. Uh, the software, uh, just as it was in the last time, 
is great because it is a internet-based software, so Inventables can update it on the fly. The downside is it is a internet-based software, so if you have power outages or a lost connection or something like that, you have the problems I had in my example. Uh, I'm kind of excited about getting another one of these into the shop. I can tell you one of the first things I'm going to be doing is putting a much bigger bit into that uh, spindle to take advantage of the router, and I've got some really nice cross sections of a crotch of a cherry tree with all that flame coming down onto it that I've been wanting to turn into a tabletop forever. I'm just going to bolt this down and use this as a slabber to flatten it all out. Great for making tabletops. I've also got a lot of tools in development that once I get tuned up for accuracy, this will be able to batch them out for me as I'm doing other works. Well, I hope you got something out of this video as we built the X car, we reviewed the process, we did a project, and we analyzed the results. And if you did, please like, favorite, subscribe, tell a friend, all that kind of social media stuff. And remember one last thing. It is always worth the effort to learn, create, share with others. Y'all be safe and have fun.